So we're talking about gut health, and gut health is really an extension of the genesis of health. But I'm hopefully I don't lose my core crew at some time in the future when we talk about, say, thyroid or adrenal health or creating neurotransmitters from the brain. And guess what we're going to titrate back to? Gut health. Okay, so it's a, it's a topic that's core to to so many different things, and, and they and we do overlap. I'm writing a grant for the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. They have these so-called pioneering grants. So you know the the worst thing that can happen to me is <clears throat> I get pigeonholed in, into a wellness program. You're a wellness program. It's like wellness programs over 20 years have a net return of zero. They fail. That's because they're using standard of care. So what I wrote here, this is, this is you know, just a rough draft for Robert Wood Johnson. This is not a disease prevention program. It is a disease reversal program. However, our program eliminates the distinction between disease prevention and reversal by explaining that everyone lies on a health disease continuum. So it's no longer about preventing or reversing, it's just about sliding down this continuum. We're all just on it in different places. And there are multiple continuums, metabolic continuum, gut continuum, you know, overall physiological continuum, disease continuum, pathological continuum. So why did I start with that? I don't know, yeah, actually I do know. Um, <clears throat> so here's our deck for today. And we're talking about gut health and then stomach acid because stomach acid is, a, is probably the strongest barometer for good gut health. If you don't have strong acid, nothing else is going to flow properly. The problem is no one's measuring gut health. <clears throat> um, what I said at the beginning of last week's one was that <clears throat> if a doctor tells you, traditional doctor tells you that your problem with reflux is you have too much acid, they're absolutely correct. They did not lie. However, they were still wrong because the problem is it's too much acid up in the esophagus and insufficient acid in the stomach. Now, if they actually measured your stomach acid and said, hmm, the pH is X, Y, Z, that's too high or too low, that's a different story. But just saying because you have heartburn, you have too much acid is really, from a scientific perspective, a very weak diagnosis. Would we agree? So, um, so where did you learn that? And they, they tell you, you have too much acid. Well, <clears throat> yes, but it's misplaced acid, okay? And because we're not on the right end of the continuum. So really the domino effect of poor health from the gut, key drivers are low stomach acid, sensitivities and allergies, and then underappreciated is kidney and liver dysfunction because Kidneys cleaning, and the liver is producing new new raw materials. So if they're not working well, then even if you're absorbing well, then you still may not be producing what you the basic building blocks you need to thrive, not just survive. And so the reason why I read that Robert Wood Johnson thing is the gut health status is a continuum, and we need to move down towards the good end of gut health. And all these drivers promote inflammation. Low stomach acid. It's gonna create a situation where you can get leaky gut syndrome. You're not digesting things, you're not breaking them down thoroughly so they can pass through and be interpreted as an invader. And your immune system responds to it, that's inflammation. Sensitivities, we all know, I I've, I've just, I had a cold, I thought I had allergies, but my nose was running like crazy. That's inflammation. And then kidney and liver dysfunction. So what's really underappreciated in um, gut health is that any number of these symptoms, <coughs> excuse me, can relate back to gut health. Fatigue, constipation's obvious, cold sores, skin rashes, that's an autoimmune response, diarrhea, GERD, bad breath. I had an engineer, and I don't have Amy on this time, she's our engineer in resonance, but engineers think very linearly. And I had this young man, Jared, in the program at a corporation, and he goes, I don't have, my stomach's perfect, I don't have reflux. 
My only problem is people won't stick around me in the morning after I have eggs because I, I have sulfur breath. And I had to say, fella, you have reflux. What's happening is you're creating some gas down here in your stomach because you're not digesting well. That gas is pushing out the sphincter valve and some, some of that stomach air is getting out and passing out into the environment. And that sulfur from the eggs and say broccoli or other, other self-containing foods is the reason why we're smelling that. It's coming up from your stomach. And he didn't believe me. And a month later, because he was a pretty healthy guy, we put him on the basic gut health revival program and he no longer had sulfur breath. So if some of you folks are now getting drips from me, it's because someone last time asked about my um, learning management system and I have a gut revival program. So you are now getting dripped on from that program every day, every second day, every fourth day, something like that, um, you'll get an email. If you don't want that, just tell me and I'll take you off that system. But what it is is just like recipe suggestions, links to um, website that gives the kind of information I'm giving here, but maybe more simply or more easily digestible, if you will. Uh, bad pun, okay. But also, um, like I think the day two, it, it sends you out a report from WebMD that talks about anybody who, who we know, I know no one in this program is on it, but if you're on a proton pump inhibitor, why it's so hard to get off of them. And it's called rebound because the proton pump inhibitors are, are like a bunch of people holding the door back from a crowd. And when you take those bouncers away or those people away and the door springs open, everybody floods in, that's your stomach acid. Overreacting to the fact that it's been sequestered, you know, stymied for so long. And so you have really, really bad symptoms. And that's one of the challenges of getting people off antacids of the rebound. So that would come out like day two. So if you're getting that, <clears throat> fine, no big deal. If you don't want it, um, otherwise just trash them. But that's why you're getting so many notice, notices from me and Healthy. You've been enrolled in this learning management program and it lasts 61 days. And you can watch them, it will track you, see how you're making progress, grade you at the end. Anybody who doesn't pass has to put up some, has to present to the group on their challenges. I'm just kidding. We know I'm just kidding there. So what I'm doing here, because the gut is, ah, it's just the stomach, right? In the beginning of the gut revival program, there's a video, and I'm just going to play it now. And it's a TED Talk. It's a very short TED Talk on how your digestive system works. And it's so outstanding that I just thought it was worth playing so we, anybody thinking about gut health could real appreciate the complexity of it. So here we go. Across the whole planet, humans eat on average between 1 and 2.7 kilograms of food a day. That's over 365 kilograms a year per person and more than 28,800 kilograms over the course of a lifetime and every last scrap makes its way through the digestive system. Comprised of 10 organs, covering 9 meters, and containing over 20 specialized cell types, this is one of the most diverse and complicated systems in the human body. Its parts continuously work in unison to fulfill a singular task, transforming the raw materials of your food into the nutrients and energy that keep you alive. Spanning the entire length of your torso, the digestive system has four main components. First, there's the gastrointestinal tract, a twisting channel that transports your food and has an internal surface area of between 30 and 40 square meters, enough to cover half a badminton court. Second, there's the pancreas, gallbladder, and liver, a trio of organs that break down food using an array of special juices. Third, the body's enzymes, hormones, nerves, and blood all work together to break down food, modulate the digestive process, and deliver its final products. Finally, there's the mesentery, a large stretch of tissue that supports and positions all your digestive organs in the abdomen, enabling them to do their jobs. The digestive process begins before food even hits your tongue. Anticipating a tasty morsel, glands in your mouth start to pump out saliva. 
we produce about 1.5 liters of this liquid our each day. Once hmm. inside your mouth, chewing yeah. combines with the sloshing saliva to turn food into a moist lump called the bolus. Enzymes present in the saliva break down any starch. Then your food finds itself at the rim of a 25 centimeter long tube called the esophagus, down which it must plunge to reach the stomach. Nerves in the surrounding esophageal tissue sense the bolus's presence and trigger peristalsis, a series of defined muscular contractions. That propels the food into the stomach, where it's left at the mercy of the muscular stomach wall. I'm stopping for a second. <clears throat> Muscular stomach walls. He doesn't really talk about this, but just make note. Walls, which pound the bolus, breaking it into chunks. Hormones secreted by cells in the lining trigger the release of acids and enzyme-rich juices from the stomach wall that start to dissolve the food and break down its proteins. These hormones... So that's the trick about measuring stomach acid, because your stomach and your entire digestive tract is a just-in-time manufacturing plant. And those of you who don't know what that means, and it just simply means that the warehouse isn't full of goods, you know, you manufacture to order. So the stomach, the gut is, um, the whole components of the gut are producing the necessary components to break down the food as the food enters. It's getting a signal from the very beginning of digestion. So the stomach isn't just floating around with um, stomach acid waiting for the food to arrive and it just plops into this pool of, of acid, per se. Bones also alert the pancreas, liver, and gallbladder to produce digestive juices and transfer bile, a yellowish-green liquid that digests fat, in preparation for the next stage. After three hours inside the stomach, the once shapely bolus is now a frothy liquid called chyme and it's ready to move into the small intestine. The liver sends bile to the gallbladder, which secretes it into the first portion of the small intestine, called the duodenum. Here, it dissolves the fats floating in the slurry of chyme so they can be easily digested by the pancreatic and intestinal juices that have leached onto the scene. These enzyme-rich juices break the fat molecules down into fatty acids and glycerol for easier absorption into the body. The enzymes also carry out the final deconstruction of proteins into amino acids and carbohydrates into glucose. This happens in the small intestine's lower regions, the jejunum and ileum, which are coated in millions of tiny projections called villi. These create a huge surface area to maximize molecule absorption. Another key word, <clears throat> which I'm gonna use shamelessly towards my point, is huge surface area and transference into the bloodstream. The blood takes them on the final leg of their journey to feed the body's organs and tissues, but it's not over quite yet. Leftover fiber, water, and dead cells sloughed off during digestion make it into the large intestine, also known as the colon. The body drains out most of the remaining fluid through the intestinal wall. What's left is a soft mass called stool. The colon squeezes this byproduct into a pouch called the rectum, where nerves sense it expanding and tell the body when it's time to expel the waste. The byproducts of digestion exit through the anus and the food's long journey, typically lasting between 30 and 40 hours, is finally complete. Ted Ed. So we will do, we'll be doing a session, probably a short one on what your poop tells you about health. Another one of my favorite topics, but um, there's a lady by the name of Mama Natural. She has a website for women's health issues mainly and she has the most fantastic video on what your poop tells you about your health and it's you know it's 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 something that you can do and analyze your your own your own health for example i won't get into it <laughs> um so let's go back to the uh the, the deck so there were a couple interesting things that were said there, <clears throat> and I'll just go through the process, but, you know, we don't have a, as a sophisticated digestive tract of, as other animals. I mean, how many stomachs does a cow have? Five, you know? Um, so 
they're eating foods that are very hard to break down. We do sometimes too, particularly with, with roughage, fiber rich vegetables, but we really got to chew our food. We can't take down big pieces. Why? Because it's just a chemical process. And he made a point very clearly that large surface area, you know, the size of half of a badminton court. <clears throat> and the more we break down the food into smaller particles, the more surface area we have, and the faster a reaction will go. Think about this. Try to light a big chunk of wood on fire with a match. It doesn't work very well. But now take a plane and create some nice curly shavings and take that match to it, it will ignite very readily. All it is is the difference in the rate of the reaction. So with your food, the more you can chew, the more time you take. Think, think about being European, French or Swiss. They take their time over the meal. There's a long delay between different courses and all that. And there's a reason behind that. And their health is much better than ours. Their food supply is better, but they also, their attitude and behaviors towards food is a lot better. They make it an event. Whereas we, food eating sometimes is a pleasure, but it's also an inconvenience. It's something we just try to rush, rush on to satisfy a response. But <clears throat> chewing well is an extremely important first piece just to create more surface area. Oopsie, I keep doing this. Um, we kind of got this from the, um, from the video, so I don't have to break, I don't have to go down into this, but there's a lot of different things that the gut is trying to do. And, you know, of course, on the kidney end, we're, we're eliminating waste. Uh, but, you know, the gut is supplying the nutrients to the kidneys as well. So, and then, you know, in the large intestine, if there's material that may make it into the large intestine that has not been totally broken down or actually has been broken down even further because of uh, bacteria. I'm, I'm getting myself confused. It's 8 o'clock at night. I'm up early. But the, the bacteria in the small intestine can lead to um, the, the bolus not being formed properly. Not the bolus. Help me. What is the what is the term for when, when they bring the uh, the waste together? I think it's the bolus. But if you have bacteria in the small intestine, that won't form properly, and that's simply constipation. Um, this is the source of acid reflux, or in the case of my friend with the sulfur breath, the you know the the cause of the vapor or the chemicals getting up the esophagus. This should be a one-way valve. So the food comes in, opens the valve one way, and then shuts, and the food stays in here and just keeps going on its merry way through the stomach. The problem is, if you don't have strong acid, and you haven't broken your food down well by chewing it well, then the process of breaking it down initially into its component parts will not go so well, and you'll get more fermentation than if you have strong acid where you quickly break it down. So when you make wine, that's a very slow process of breaking down the complex sugars into alcohol, okay? You could certainly accelerate that rate chemically, and you wouldn't get the gas given off and you wouldn't get the wine as it's made today. But we don't want the fermentation gas is being released, and what this will do is build up pressure and then push whatever liquid is in here up, and this, is, this sphincter valve is only so powerful, it'll bypass that and go up. And what people will feel will, with the acid in the, in the esophagus up here is heartburn, but some people have constriction in their throat and actually have to have it surgically widened but the problem is they have acid reflux, but they don't have heartburn. They don't have GERD. So the diagnosis is we don't know why you're getting constriction in your throat. But it's just an inflammatory process from the acid that doesn't belong in the throat. And then some people are even getting teeth erosion. Okay, so we go from heartburn to constriction in the throat, or difficulty swallowing, to teeth erosion, to people smelling halitosis. So those are sort of the stages of 
of um, the reflux phenomenon that occurs when we're, but it's really just a sign that our stomach acid isn't strong enough and or we're not chewing well enough so we're breaking down the food so it can be digested in, in that two to three hours and sent to the next stage of where it's being further broken down. <clears throat> So I'm on my, we need grit, you know, fetish, if you will. Uh, and I'm going to show you a little, another video, because he clearly said that the stomach is extremely muscular. So it's pounding that food. Okay, it's pounding it. But if you have a little grit in there and you're pounding, it's going to work much better. And I think we're designed to have grit. So I just want to show a little video of uh, another really fantastic thing. I'm not going to do the whole thing. It's very short. But basically, this is BBC. And this uh, reporter or scientist, I'm not sure which, swallowed a, a little pill camera. And they're tracking the pill camera through his digestion. And I'm starting here on him eating a large meal. I ate for breakfast. I'm going to test the powers of my digestive system by feeding it a substantial meal. With a big meal of steak and chips inside me, my stomach has expanded. The average human stomach can expand from the size of a small apple when it's empty to about two liters when full. The camera has now been traveling inside me for over four hours and embarked on the longest part of its journey. The tight folds on the wall of the small intestine are mixing and churning my mushed up food in a... Mixing and churning in a screw-like motion. So what I suggested to people on the Monday is, you know, you can get some bentonite clay that's purified, you can take that, but I have an old, old grape arbor with Concord grapes for making wine or red grapes. I'm not sure what type they are. And they have seeds. And I'm just eating the seed and all, chewing it well. And that's creating little particles that I'm taking into my digestive tract. And so when this thing is churning and tumbling, it's contributing to the break, breaking down of that food. Look, we are in an environment where Maynard Murray showed in 19... 58, that soils were already depleted um, from a mineral content compared to 1900. So we're at a nutrient deficiency you know, situation already. So whatever we can do to enhance absorption, obviously enhance nutrient density by choosing good foods, but enhancing absorption, making sure your acid is right, making sure the microbiome is robust, but all these other things will contribute. Chewing, simple things like that. So let's go back. And these videos are linked. That's only a four minute video or so anyway. Are linked in here. So that's the link to that video. Um, so what he said is in the YouTube, the previous one is next is the stomach, an organ with strong muscular wall. So it's really trying to, it's not just chemical. All I'm trying to make is the point is mechanical as well. Every other, every other animal is using mechanical and digestion, except for us, because we're ultra clean. So the kite folds in the wall of the small intestine are mixing and churning. Every good chemical engineer knows that we put media into a mixer to break up the, the substances faster. So I'm pretty sure this group knows this, but I'm happy you're here for reinforcement. Strong stomach acid creates an environment that's hostile for bad bacteria. Why, why this good and bad look? It's, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of like saying all fat is bad. You know, there's good fat and there's bad fat. Organism, some organisms, Dr. Carter was on last time, are called commensal at a certain level they're actually beneficial. And when they get out of hand to a certain higher level, then they become pathogenic. It's no different than uh, politics. 
You know, when you get to a certain level of power, it, it corrupts no matter how uh, sincere, honest, or integrous you, you seem to start out at. But there's no question that strong, strong acid is, has, we've adapted to have beneficial bacteria prefer that environment. When I went to St. Lucia, at the 2,000 foot pitons, they have these sulfur hot springs that are like boiling hot water, higher, you know, higher temperature because of pressure than 212, yet there are organisms living in there. Okay, so organisms can adapt to almost any environment. Okay, and so H. pylori, is trying to live in our live in our tissue, feeding off our blood. Starts in the gum lining. We talked about that. Gets into the gut. Doesn't like the strong acid down there. So what does it do? It's evolved to produce a base, ammonia, to neutralize the acid. So it creates an environment more suitable for itself and less suitable for the beneficial organism. So the beneficial organisms reduce and the pathogenic organisms proliferate. And that's what's going on. So when we take an antacid, we're just putting things on the side of the uh, pathogens. We're making it better for them. That's all we're doing. And the proton pump inhibitors particularly um, reduce acid much more tremendously than the, um, than the, uh, than like Tums. And the reason is, these block, they block the production of the acid. So when you take a Tums, your body will produce and secrete new acid. But when you take the proton pump inhibitors, there's no acid being produced. So it's just pure neutralization. So it's really a, a nasty, nasty thing in terms of gut health. Now, so your intestinal tract is lined with colonies of good bacteria, the colonies of diverse friendly bacteria called the microbiome. Now I'll just pull up a, a website here that I don't have linked anywhere, but I'll just pull her up because she's the most fantastic Alzheimer's researcher in the world. Uh, and she published a paper called Alzheimer's Aspiroketosis. I mean, she's not a good marketing person kind of like me, but she has really led the charge on the emerging role of infection in Alzheimer's disease. <clears throat> Hard to see, but you know, it's um, uh, Judith, M-I-K-L-O-S-S-Y. And what she told me, because we're quite friendly, she invited me to Switzerland a couple years ago and uh, went to Crans, Montana, where they had uh, sanatoriums for leprosy and things like that, you know, vitamin D curing leprosy. But what she told me is in her study, she's shown that if she keeps giving the same probiotic to a person that has a deficient microbiome, that they respond at first and then they don't get better, they sometimes get worse. And that's because of a narrow range of, of strains, narrow range of organisms that then take over. So even, even though they're supposedly good for our gut, we need diversity. It's just like you know the, the multiple <laughs> organs in the gut. We don't just have one organ, we have multiple organs working together. That was a very clear message stated at the very beginning, how all the 20 organs are working together in the whole process of, of digestion. So what she simply recommends is rotation and making sure that you're, you're eating foods that are probiotic, that have organisms in there already. You know, like I recommend the Bravo. For people with really bad gut dysbiosis, it's a starting point, but I don't necessarily recommend that you stay on Bravo long term. It's something you might do once every three months, once every six months, something like that, just as a sort of a, a jump start or a kickstart or a renewal of the diversity down there <clears throat> in the gut. So that's, you know, that's from someone, she's an MD, PhD researcher, but she sees people. That's an important differentiator. Like Dr. Tansy at Harvard, wonderful researcher, some of his stuff you know, he's the Kennedy Chair Professor, so his research is beyond reproach. But his idea of, you know, an Alzheimer's model is Alzheimer's in a Petri dish. I'm sorry, a human being with Alzheimer's is much more complex than anything you can create in a Petri dish. So, but, you know, Tansy and McClosey work together. 
and they both have something to bring to the table. Um, I don't think I need to go over junk food, but the problem with junk food is sugars are alcohols, and alcohols are as closely related in chemistry to a base as you possibly can get. And a base neutralizes an acid. So therefore, an alcohol, sugary foods, corn syrup, all that stuff, taxes your production of acid. So that's why, you know, people are drinking the sodas, or, you know, they, they're dealing with obesity, but they really just have inflammation. Their gut's a mess. Half the reason why they're obese is because they're not digesting well, so they're not absorbing well, so their brain is telling them that they have insufficient nutrients and signals hunger. You know, but the, but the root cause is, number one, very easily absorbed calories with very low nutrients, and it's reducing acid levels in the stomach, so more difficult things to absorb nutrients, minerals, aren't absorbed well. So it's, it's a double-edged sword. And then of course, anything that has an inflammatory aspect to it, so the vegetable oils, I mean, veganism is great, but for goodness sake, stay away from the vegetable oils, stay away from the omega-6s. We have to have a balance between omega-6 and omega-3. And we'll go over that in much more detail. We talked about that in the genesis of health. but. Um, So where are we? We are, uh, you know, inflammation, you can have sensitivities. For example, you can have a food allergy, but it may not be a pro it may be just a gut problem. The real issue becomes when we start breaking down the gut lining. You know, on the TED Talk, they showed a very neat little picture of of blue lines with little things going through them and then red lines with little things going through them and they said the nutrients go into the uh, from the gut into the into the blood bloodstream well there's a barrier there that controls that it's a sieve it's just a you know it, it's the um, tight junctions it's called so those tight junctions are critical and any of these other syndromes uh, SIBO, irritable bowel syndrome, diverticulitis, those are nasty, nasty intestinal problems that we want to solve. And we can solve those by reducing the inflammation, getting rid of foods that may, have, may not affect us, but affect someone with these diseases, so things that are very difficult to break down. You know, Gundry talks about the lectins, and those will have more of an impact on someone with poor uh, gut balance and poor stomach acid and poor microbiome integrity and diversity. No question about that. But the real issue is these kinds of gut problems are really a sign that you may be heading towards leaky gut syndrome. And when that happens, then the horse is out of the barn. Things are flowing from the blue in the gut to the red into the bloodstream and now circulating all over the body. So just like the periodontal disease in the mouth can circulate through the nervous tissue and the vascular, um, the nervous system and the vascular system, the same with the gut when it becomes leaky and it's a, it's a very likely source of pathogens or contaminants or insults or toxicity in our body. <clears throat> so of course these symptoms you talked about at the beginning, anything that's non-gut related that can be related back to the gut probably infers intestinal permeability. And zonulin's a test for it. We now can do a zonulin test because zonulin's a molecule associated with the formation of the tight junctions. And when the tight junctions break, the zonulin molecule is released. And we can see that in the blood. So if anybody has suspicion about leaky gut, the thing is to determine why you have leaky gut. We want to stop the, stop the drain first. Look at food sensitivities, you can do substitution. Look at, you know, consideration for your, your um, 
microbiome. Uh, groups like Biome can do some basic testing of the gut, um, but just judging from food journals, food diaries, we can tell whether you know you have decent gut integrity. Symptoms like heartburn, things like that, will back titrate to that. But then, if you're having downstream conditions, the easiest way to tell if it's coming from the gut is to do the zonulin test. And so, this is relatively new information for me. I'm look, I've been telling people to take um, glutamine or ion biome to just keep the, the uh, tight junctions in, in good shape. But uh, actually being able to test that is something that I'm, you know, Dr. Carter does it every day, but I'm now bringing it into my program. So um, do's and don'ts. You know, I think it's um, pretty straightforward. One word on the label, that's critical. Fermented foods, you know, soy is a problem in America, but like things like miso, fermented soy, uh, kimchi. If you, ha if you um, ever been to a Korean restaurant and those guys are as quick with the dishes as the Japanese uh, folks are with the knives, they're just throwing out little dishes and every single one of them is fermented. The French eat a tremendous amount of fermented foods. You know, the Europeans eat a lot of fermented foods. Uh, the Asian cultures. A lot of fermented foods. It's not uh, it's not coincidence that they live longer than Americans for any one of these reasons related back to that. So you know, asparagus is a probiotic. Onion is a probiotic. Cabbage is a probiotic. The difference between a probiotic and a prebiotic: a probiotic has living organisms that feed the gut. Um, so not all these are probiotic, but anything fermented, you know, I suggest people with memory issues, you know, beets produce nitric oxide as uh, L-arginine. So fermented beets would be something to take in. I, I enjoy them. They're a little sweet, but if your insulin's under control, then sweet's not a problem. Um, something I really enjoy thoroughly. My tip on beets is don't boil them, roast them. Roast your beets. That's a sidebar. I just happen to, my kids, I forced them to eat beets and they hated me for it. And today they're all beet lovers. So our favorite salad is a beet, goat cheese, um, you know, like a, Greek, like a Greek salad with a lot of other things in it. But the, the main thing is beets, goat cheese, and, and blue cheese. So you get a lot of fermentation in that mixture with the uh, nitric oxide contributors. The slide's a little busy, but pickles, kimchi, olives, it's biblical. Uh, why kombucha? Kombucha. I have kombucha brewing over here, but it's so acidic that I go out and buy store-bought kombucha and mix them. But why would that be a good drink to take in? Why would an acidic drink to be good, a fermented acidic drink be good to, to take in? Because the organisms there are adapted to strong acid. And your stomach is strong acid, so they're already prepared. There's a lot of hype and myth about taking a probiotic and the stomach acid kills it. Well, with kombucha, that pH is around two and a half, and the stuff I've made is much stronger than that. So those organisms, and it's easy. You can go, I'm not a, I, I don't buy anything from Amazon, but you can go on Amazon and buy the, uh, the pre-kombucha thing, forget what it's called, but you can make your own. It's not that hard with black tea. Um, and then you add sugar. And, you know, the difference between the kombucha I'm making and the kombucha you get in the store is I fermented mine a lot longer. So all the sugar is gone, whereas the store-bought, it's not as sweet as a, as a uh, soda. Where, where are we in the country? They call it pop, soda, whatever. Um, but it still has quite a bit of sugar. And when you go to the point of mine, there's no sugar left. It's completely fermented. Sauerkraut, good Polish stuff, cabbage. So Dr. Brody, for those of you taking notes, I would highly recommend you go to a website 
one radio network. I should put this on here. One radio network. It's all one word. I think it's one radio network.com and Patrick Timponi and just do a search for Thomas Barodi. Very few people have heard him in this country. He's in Sydney, Australia, but we got him on at midnight his time and he did a one hour interview and then Patrick and I got to talk to him afterwards. And he was on the Nobel Prize team that developed the triple antibiotic for H. pylori. And so he's traditional, but he's gone way beyond traditional. And he says, you know, he, he treats inflammatory bowel disease. That's what he does. But he said in the interview we did with him that he never thought as a humble gastroenterologist that he'd be reversing so many severe chronic conditions just by fixing the gut. And so he is on the Open Biome Project, which is temporarily shut down in the United States for fear of COVID contamination of the samples. But this is a program, a little gross indeed, but where healthy donors are well tested. If they're considered healthy, they can donate their fecal matter, which is then converted into a suppository. But now they've perfected it so that Tom Brody, I saw him interviewed, he calls the thing now a crapsule. So I thought it was important that I gave Tom, a call, Dr. Brody, a call and say, hey, maybe that's not the best marketing campaign I've ever heard, you know, a crapsule. But if you look at it, it's called, they're calling it a crapsule. I have no idea what the final, but the company that's, that's working with him is out of Somerville, Massachusetts. And I used to live in Somerville when I went to MIT, so, um, but it, What's the difference between, say, Bravo and, and a Crapsule? Is Bravo is based on a process that's probably producing the same diversity of organisms every time. Whereas a Crapsule probably has a different diversity, a different set of organisms, and it's probably different every time depending on where the person was from, what they ate, you know, how, so I mean, it's like, it's just, it's just going to provide you with more diversity. Do I recommend healthy people do that? First of all, in America, you can't be in the open biome project. And there are, I think there's around a thousand locations. So it's not a small project, but you have to have C. diff to be treated. But outside of the country, I think these, this program, this is, this is available. Why do I talk about something like this? Because it just, emphasizes how important diversity is. It's diversity in the microbiome. And I, I love this quote, it just takes courage and takes years and years to persevere to change paradigms. His mentor and colleague on the Nobel Prize team, I'm not sure if it was Warren or Marshall, infected themselves with H. pylori because no one believed the cause and effect between H. pylori and stomach ulcer. And that's how desperate they were to leave a legacy that they totally believed in. And I have in my chronic disease temperature book quotations from gastroenterologists that now are big believers in what they did that said at the time they thought it was preposterous and these guys were lunatics. Uh, so anyway, um, you know, to treat H. pylori, the standard of care uses Prilosec or one of these things, and someone is using that, you know, in this program to um, get rid of H. pylori because other things didn't work. And they asked me if they should use the proton pump inhibitor. And I said, well, they're really just worried about Barrett's esophagus, esophagulitis, when you have reflux so much that eventually the inflammation of it can cause esophageal cancer. So my recommendation is if anybody you know is being treated for H. pylori in the standard of care with the double antibiotic that they use now and the proton pump inhibitor, my advice is don't necessarily use the proton pump inhibitor. Maybe use Pepto-Bismol or Maalox or titrate the PPI per need, rather just do a 
14 or 21 day course like they recommend. Because all they're trying to do is stop um, rebound, which is what the antibiotics is causing, um, and then exacerbating the reflux that you already have. So um, if you're not testing, you're guessing. What's interesting about H. pylori is everybody sort of gets a finite number when I test for it. And I test for it in the blood. And based on my population that I've done, I've done about 50 to 80 H. pylori tests now. The standard of care says 0 0.9 is sort of the limit to where they believe above that. Now you have symptomology from H. pylori. And I'm seeing it around 0 0.5, 0 0.6. But at least we have that number to go by. So it's a finite number rather than a less than a number. We, we're, everybody's getting a finite number, so we have a way to track where they are on the H. pylori scale. So what I'm saying is below 0 0.5, 0 0.5, everybody seems to be still, still positive for H. pylori. It's ubiquitous, okay? But it seems to be more of a benign at that point. Um, you never know when someone turns up positive for something as, a, as an insult in the gut that they're eating every day. So um, this is a participant and we did a food allergy test and of all things, I go to their CDA, they're a daily coffee drinker and coffee, this test is not only looking at antibodies against coffee, but also is it uh, stimulating what's called complement activation, which is really a marker for inflammation. So it's a combination. I've asked them to break the score out. I, know, I now know the CEO is a good guy, but um, right now they're giving a single score. So this would be something that not only is a sensitizing agent in this test, KBMO, but also creating inflammation. And it's only one out of, you know, there's not a lot of inflammatory things on this panel here. So it may not be creating an overall inflammatory milieu in the gut, but it's something with, to work on. So what we're doing with this individual is we're titrating off coffee for six weeks, keeping track of how they're doing, and then potentially, depending on how they feel about it, reintroducing coffee and just seeing if there's any change because I don't want to put someone in prohibition if it's really not aggravating a, a situation, you know. An allergy, you know, any kind of allergy, things that you're with pollen is, you know, we, we don't completely avoid it and we cope with it, we manage with it and we survive with it and there's all different degrees. So, uh, but I'll let them make that choice. So, Healthy gut is the first step towards a healthy body. And the only reason why I let Jasmine put that in there is because the mouth, the oral cavity is part of the gut system. So that applies. Um, anybody have any questions or comments? Virginia, is that pages and pages of copious notes, I hope? I'm gonna be listening again. Uh, I, I think the videos were phenomenal. Weren't they? And I really appreciate that because we can, all of us can sit in and you know all this information. You're a science guy and you have to talk to us like we're not science people and give us, um, you know, deliver in a way that is engaging. And it's about on the eighth grade level, really, because this science is complicated. And I, I thought the videos were both phenomenal. And I've been in a number of high level um functional nutrition classes, and I've never seen videos quite that good. You know, um, there's an old proverb, you know, if you, you listen, you retain a few percent. If you write it down, you retain 10%, but if you teach it, you, you retain 70%. So yeah. what I recommend is any one of you folks pick a topic and lead a session, and you will now know it better than anybody else. Because <laughs> there's no question, every time I go through this, I learn something new or different. You know, Dr. Carter goes to me, there's this, not a clairvoyant, but he has this 
this sense, and I got his name is Williams something, something Williams. And Dr. Carter, I haven't really watched his video in time, but Dr. Carter, that's what he does. He's just a learned man. And he's like, he says, this guy's really on to something. He really, everything is spot on, but he just does it from, you know, the ether. And it's like, celery juice is a big thing. And I'm saying, Michael, I'm just going to eat celery. And he goes, no. No, you, you have to juice it. And I'm saying to myself, no, you don't. But he's saying, yeah, you do. So we get into this argument. And then I realize in America, yeah, we have to juice it. Because we don't chew it. In right. modern civilization, we have to juice it because we don't chew it well. Uh -huh. And we don't have the particulate in our gut, the grit, to do the exact same thing. We do not have a juicer in our stomach. Well, Tom, I want to say this. I think it's so good that you don't have an MD because the MDs, you wouldn't be this curious and this um, uh, able to relate and to make it fun and entertaining and engaging. So I, I really think you've got all the degrees you need. I'm just sorry. Yeah, well, don't worry. I'm not going in that direction. I, you know. But, you know, Dr. Trump was a classic MD. And, and you know, when someone asked him, he said, Where, why did you go down this path? He would always just say, because I'm curious. So he was a really... He was really a medical scientist. You know, when he, he said, I'm just looking at the eye as a, as a biomarker for systemic disease in 1980. And he gave up his entire traditional career and created a new career, which no one else has followed, you know. But, you know, that's the way it goes. But um, Hey, Tom, I have two short proton pump inhibitor stories that oh, I'd please. like to share. Um. So I've hung around the medical world and been to medical conferences for 10 years, but I, I was a CPA in my first life, so I don't have a science mind or a science background, but I've been places where mostly it's doctors and nutritionists for 10 years. It's sitting in the room wanting to know what they know. Well, I got the, one of the topics, and you know we know it's about less medications in our society, and one of the biggest offenders is these proton pump inhibitors. So a number of years ago, a friend of mine from Orlando called me to say, you've got to go check on Becky, her good friend that lived near me, because she's been, um, she's been in the hospital. Becky's a, a healthy, early 60s. Uh, she's been in the hospital. She's had blood transfusions. She can't, the doctors cannot figure out what's wrong with her. So I knew just enough, just enough, right. to ask the one question that would always look at the offender first, which could be a proton pump inhibitor, one of the worst offenders. Mm -hmm. So I asked her, I said, Becky, is there any, and she looks, you know, she's nearly depressed because she's not absorbing. It's, she's now getting ready to put on psych meds because her life is tumbling down, well, right? And they can't figure out, serotonin. They can't, yeah, they can't figure out what's wrong. And I said, so Becky, any chance you're on one of those purple pills or those proton pump inhibitors? Yes. How did you know? So this poor woman had been through all these hospitalizations, working with all these doctors. And I had just, and so all of us on this call, getting this information, just the truth about proton pump inhibitors, what they do, we now have more information that's relevant and important than is being shared by doctors. Oh, yeah. So I think it's really important you're sharing this. So I, I connected her with a nutritionist who helped her get off of this medication. She was not even able enough to drive. And I kept her from getting onto psych meds. And then I saw her in a store after that, and she said, why didn't my doctor ever tell me this? Because she said, right on the box, it says you could only be on this for 14 days or whatever it was. Um, and then more recently, I had the phlebotomist that showed up to take a blood draw for work I'm doing with Tom. And she says, you know, I'm just gaining so much weight, and I've given up eating meat because I couldn't digest it. I couldn't digest meat. Uh-huh. I said, oh, gosh, she said, and I said, so are you on any medications like proton pump inhibitors? <laughs> yes. And then I explained to her how it all worked. And, and I said, and so then what can happen is you can begin to feel foggy in the brain and a little bit of depression. She says, yeah, I've, I've had nervousness, and I, I, they put me on a medication for that. <laughs> so you don't have to have a medical degree to sort a lot of this out to bring people's awareness to See, that's how why, serious. That's why proton pump inhibitors 
even though they don't cost a lot of money, they're generic over the counter and statins yeah. are totally promoted because a statin drug, the number one drug that statins are, are promoting is Entresto. You, mm -hmm. you watch 60 Minutes to find out what the big blockbusters are. Entresto for heart failure. What's causing heart failure? Statin drugs. Mm -hmm. Lowering CoQ10, it's hurting the muscle. And the heart muscle is, is, is a muscle as well. And the, so type two diabetes, because you're uh, affecting fat transport to the body, body, so you're glucose, insulin dependent, things like that. So the downstream effects of these drugs are, and believe me, the researchers and the business people know this because I've talked to them directly. I talked yeah. to the developers of Lipitor. Well, and, and they, they, there's some very interesting materials, and maybe you'll look for it. Um, Tom, it'd be very interesting to share um, the nutrients that are depleted by the various medications. There's some quite interesting, I have it, if, I, if you don't have it, I have a chart somewhere that I got at a conference, but it lists all the nutrients that are depleted in individual medications, which is actually, I believe, part of the approval process is that they actually know what they do as part, they know that this is going on and this is, this is common. It, this is that's just area, standard. I mean, that's an area I haven't ever studied. Um, I'm looking well, at major effects, but that's interesting. But let me just, closing, you know, on a positive note, and I, I think everybody here knows of this gentleman, but this is a traditional doctor, he's a pulmonologist, he runs a clinic, he sees people. He has a small team. I've written to him, but I'd like to talk to him about our pre-cytokine storm testing that I think he'd find interesting for COVID. He's not, not just talking about COVID, but he's training doctors on topics, and I think lay people can understand substantially this content, okay, that he's giving. So it's called MedCram, M-E-D-C-R-A-M. That's his, that's his YouTube channel. I've watched a lot of those. He's great. Who's saying that, Amy? Yeah. Yeah. Can you see me or hear me? Yes, I do. I just couldn't quite tell who was talking. About yeah. But this one. No, I, I keep watching him because he's a, he's so the, his delivery is like so relaxed and so. Oh my. I don't know how anyone could get mad at him or like I don't know you you just you cannot not believe him. But this this is one where all he does is he the difference between him and the average doctor because he's teaching. Mm -hmm. so he has to read his journals and when you read your journals you know there's a lot of corruption in the journals but when you read enough of them and you start understanding disease fundamentally then you can glean the, the truth from the from the you know fabricated statistics this guy knows what he's talking about he's a traditional doctor and this one is particularly good I think it's episode 59 and this, I think I, I just watched 46, he talked about, but he's talking about, you know, things that the CDC is finally ceding to, you know, very cautiously and, you know, not over exuberantly, but he talks about his daily regimen of vitamin D, C, zinc, uh, quercetin, and NAC, and he backs it up with data. So this is, you know, this is really good stuff. I'm not doing quercetin right now just because I've been too lazy to buy it. <laughs> if I wasn't, I would get it. Um, I think you, everybody wants that. Mm -hmm. or, um, but watch it. At the end, I think he gets a little crazy about, I think this is the one where he starts talking about um, what he does to sanitize himself after being in the clinic with COVID people. So you don't have to watch that because it's over the top in terms of gloves and protection and showers and hot, hot water washing of his gown and stuff like that but you know he, he for the first 10 minutes he talks about this is really important he understands the concept of numbers to treat numbers to treat of four is an extraordinarily efficacious thing mm -hmm. numbers to treat is the absolute benefit okay every drug that's on the market is presented to you in a relative benefit and it's very simple if two died, now only one died, that's 50%. But if it was 10 people, two died before, now one died, that's 10%. Mm -hmm. They presented as 50, two to one. If it's out of 100, and the first group two died, and then the second group only one died, 
they present it as a 50% benefit. But it's really how, how do they get away with that? How is that possible? So this is, I just had this argument with the deputy editor of the New England Journal of Medicine. And Dr. Tremp was a subscriber to the New England Journal of Medicine since 1968. And he read every article, not just in his discipline, every article. But every year, because he was a member for so long, they wrote to him. Dr. Trump, what can the New England Journal of Medicine do, you know, Harvard, to maintain its position as the top medical journal in the world? And every year, Dr. Trump wrote back a very terse comment. Very simple. Never publish a relative statistic. Only publish absolute statistics in terms of numbers to treat. Because you can't compare an abs a relative statistic one study to another. But an absolute statistic, you can in engineering, you couldn't do something like that. It just, it just, it would not be possible. No, and How? keep in mind, on the label of the drug, when they present the harm, guess what they presented in? Absolute statistics. Hmm. So they present the harm in absolute, and they present the benefit in relative. Yeah, that's and so... You the two numbers, and you think, oh, it's only 3% mortality, but a 50% benefit, I'll take that. But really, it's a minuscule benefit. This is Lucentis, the eye injections for macular degeneration. They report on the label 25 to 4.5% mortality in three years. It's huge. But we've been so sanitized to thinking 4% is nothing because we see the statin benefits 25%, and this benefits 40%. They're all meaningless. They're nothing. Yeah. I did the statin study, and it's 0.3% benefit, absolute, on a very narrow cohort of people with pre-existing cardiovascular disease, 0.3%. And that's the Zocor study. It's in my book. No one wants to do statistics like that. But I didn't do it. Dr. Trump did it, and he showed it to me. He said, check these numbers. And I said, you've got to be kidding me. This is like, this is so can, can you believe anything? I don't know. No. I, I will talk, I will, I will someday dissect Dr. Ioannidi's paper that he wrote in 2003 titled, Why Most Published Research is False. And he's had five million reads. John Ioannidi's, and he's a, he's a nobody. He's just a chaired full professor at Stanford. Yeah, I watched him. I, I think you put a few of his things on COVID. Yeah, I put a few of his stuff up, yeah. Yeah, yeah he's interesting. So, yeah, but this guy here, how do you pronounce his name? I can't remember, but um, he's brilliant. And then Ioannidis is, you know, he is a real statistician, and he goes in and studies things to show why they're flawed. I wrote to him one time. I said, John, I think you popped out on this one. He said, I have to reach across the aisle once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because well, he, if he gets demonized or marginalized, then his message is lost. So he has to stay. You know, he has to play right. play a fine line. Anyway, anybody? It's else a shame. Any comments? Shame. <sighs> Keep watching. My, I enjoy yes. chatting to this group. Love it. At least I believe you. <laughs> All righty. Well, we'll see. Hey, I have a. I have, Go ahead, we're still there. I, I have a quick question on vitamin D, and what resources you would rely on because we know that if you go into most of the research is still so low. What are you recommending on vitamin D, and what research might you be relying upon for recommendations during these times for that dosing and levels? So. Uh, the data I have is a very simple thing. It's a chart of, I think it might have shown it, a chart of light hitting the earth and all-cause cancer mortality. And, you know, uh, I would say that um, I'm, I'm having a blank on his name. But let Hollick? Me... Are you talking about Michael Hollick, Michael vitamin Hollick. D, on Vitamin D Council? Yeah, you know, he, was, he was thrown out of the um, Dermatology Society for promoting sun exposure 30, 20 years ago. So you still think he's a good resource in he's terms of vitamin Now my limits, my limits of normal are slightly different than his. My limits of normal are 50 to 75. 
50 to 75 nanograms per milliliter is where I want to be. You know, a little higher is no big deal. A little lower, not, not so much either. It's probably a little wider than that, but 50 to 75 is where I want people to be. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, what people aren't looking at is vitamin 25 hydroxy vitamin D is the militia in the, in the barracks. Mm -hmm. The active form is 125 dihydroxy vitamin D. It's confusing because one's 25 hydroxy vitamin D and one is one, one, number one, comma, 25 dihydroxy is called the activated form. And that, in people that have chronically low vitamin D, the activated form should be looked at. And, uh, and, but generally, vitamin D is activated for infection, especially into the 125 dihydroxy, called calcitriol. It's really the, I call it, with vitamin A, God's antibiotic. So usually there's, there's an elevated infectious burden in those people. If you fix the infectious burden, then the, the activated form will go down and your, your natural form will go up. R rule of thumb, if you're taking 5,000 units a day, you should land at 55 nanograms per mole. Nanograms, not nanomole. A lot of the Europeans use nanomole, and you'll see a lot of people say nanomole. And if you want to be on the nanomole scale at the right level, you're going to multiply by 2.5. So if they say, you know, 50 nanomoles is acceptable, um, it's really they're off, they're off by a factor. You gotta you gotta increase it by two and a half. So, so the nano nanomoles, if it was fifty, your divide by two and a half, your actual would be twenty. So the, the problem with vitamin D, they have nanomoles uh, per nanograms per mole, and they have nanograms per milliliter. So they have two different scales. So that can get confusing. So Dr. Barodi talks about it in, in moles. And he says, you should be around 150. Everybody says, oh, that's way too high, or 200. But when you divide by two and a half, it brings it down to the US scale, which is nanograms per milliliter, not nanomoles. Enough confusion for one night, huh? But mm -hmm. most labs, LabCorp expresses it, as we understand, nanograms per milliliter. And in that scale, you should be between 50 and 75. If you take 5,000 IU, which is sounds like a big number, but it's still micrograms of vitamin D, really, then you should land at 55. And if that's the case, then you're sort of what I call in vitamin D homeostasis. You're not, you're not in desperate need of recruiting that into the liver to convert it to the active form. If that makes sense. All righty, all. Have a great evening. <laughs>